definition of Daniel's filming style is imperfect. That's a perfect but that is a style that yeah, works. That's true. It is a perfect no, encapsulation. It's a style. It's a style I can't do. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes stuff looks too polished. Yeah. I love how this is in the camera for the first part of the video. Thank you. All right. It, already, it was rolling. That's perfect. All right. Welcome All right. back, everybody. It's me. I was on camera. <laughs> Hey, you know, very, just keep very, talking stuff going, about it. Talk to very <laughs> That's the thing about right. you, Daniel. Right. All right. Perfect to end disarming. All right, well, guys, welcome back. All right, this is the most imperfect video possible. If you guys want to see quality content, go to caldea.com. Is that right? No, no, Utah. Not even close. Utah. Oh. <laughs> 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 you can do worldofchaldea.com or on YouTube. www.youtube.com, <laughs> <laughs> World of Chaldea. That's right. All right. This is, guys, this is supposed to be a serious oh, that's right. discussion. Serious. Of the serious. Same faces. All right. All right, guys. So as you guys have known in the preview, this is all about just some Brian Weissman drills, the CEO of Magic, ex-CEO, <laughs> about why the hell he did what he did. So go ahead, Brian. All right, well, yeah. This is a question that actually came up in our conversation. We're not going to remember without dreaming yeah. a little more. That was uh, intriguing, actually, something yeah. I've considered. Yeah. And in conversations with you last time we chatted, you told me a bunch of backstory, actually, about how, well, for example, how the magic borders came to be, the famous magic borders, and primarily right. the discrepancy between alpha and beta. Right. Which right. is a fascinating story in its own right. But that actually led me to a question that even predated that, which was simply, why Cardamundi? How did how did a little tiny relatively nascent game company in Seattle, Washington, wind up making a connection with a company way off in Belgium to print right. its right. product? So, so the weird thing is, like, we had no uh, experience making trading card games because they didn't exist. Right, they weren't a thing. Right, no, the the idea of a trading card game was a new product. Right, and. We also, our background, even though we are a young company, we have been making role-playing products, which were books. What, and so, yeah, what, games, what, what, we, what games were they? Uh, we did a, uh, a series called The Primal Order, which I authored with uh, Legends designer Steve Connor, the two of us, and, uh, and Beverly, and several others, uh, Beverly Marstein, and David Howe, etc. Um, a book, an RPG book about playing gods in role-playing games. That's what Primal Order was. That's what Primal Order was. And we did a game line called Talislana. Was Primal um, Order, was it like Dungeons and Dragons at all? What was it like? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. My yeah, only, yeah obviously, yeah. that's my it's, only frame of reference. It was, it was for use with Dungeons and Dragons and other fantasy, really? and other okay. role-playing games. So it was meant to be an accompanying product to yes. play with the indie. That's exactly right. Interesting. Cool. Yeah, right. yeah. And so that was our background, and then Richard Garfield gives us, not gave it, but, you know, comes up with Magic the Gathering. We're like, well, and we have many problems to solve to bring this product to market, and one of them was, how do you print it? Right, of course. Like, we didn't know where to go to print a product like this. And, of course, we talked to our printers that we had, which were book printers, they had no idea how to make this. And were they all, and located, then, were they all located in Washington? It, yeah, well, no, in the Midwest. In the Midwest. We, we were using so a American book. company. Peter, yeah, hold American on real quick. Hold on a second. Yeah. Brian, when you ask a question, speak louder, by the way, both of you, stop interrupting what he says, because we have to hear about what he says. Okay. Continue on, everybody. Go. Uh, the, the idea of, <laughs> the irony of Daniel, Daniel Chang stop so, talking with me for interruptions <laughs> is not lost on anyone. Yeah. All right, continue so, on. Continue. So, let's not listen to him. Yeah. <laughs> but louder, louder, because it's so, uh, yeah, uh, right. yeah. So we um uh, we didn't uh, so even conceptually though, like what type of company to go to to print these because yeah. it was a. Uh, it was we wanted the game on nice quality cards, like casino cards. Right. And so you could go to a traditional uh, poker card company, but they needed to be sorted like you would find with sports cards, right. baseball cards, right? And so then you might go to a trading card company. But there was no, there was like we weren't aware of anybody doing a game like Magic that required both. I was very nervous about going to a trading card company because I was afraid that they would steal the idea, oh, I right? Like, I was like that. And so, uh, and I wasn't even sure where to go. You, you'd hear of companies, right? So I went to other game companies and said, hey, where would you print a game like this? And um, uh, trying to be a little bit coy about all the secret sauce of the game. Hypothetically, yeah. if we had a game that was... Yeah, yeah. but uh, you know, without really giving away too much. And uh, I talked to another a number of game companies, and um, everybody was like, I have no idea. Um, and, or, or 
uh, let me think about that and get, get back to you. So in the process, that's the phase I was in. And then in 1992 at Gen Con, uh, this was a year before Magic would be released, a year later, I, um, a guy named Mark Reinhagen, who was the, one of the designers of Vampire the Masquerade, which is a very famous role-playing system. Uh, he was one of the partners of White Wolf. He comes up to me and says, hey, Peter, that card game you were telling me about, um, I know the guy that can make that. And I'm like, really? Hmm. He says, yeah, yeah, he's over at my booth. You want to come over and meet him? I'm like, yeah, sure. Amazing so, coincidence, yeah. So, well, I mean, I was talking to a number of people, right? Yeah. So it was a matter of getting out there and getting on the radar. So Mark, uh, so I went over to the, car, uh, to the uh, White Wolf booth, and um, Mark says, you'll recognize him immediately. He's the only person here at the convention wearing a suit. <laughs> so I, I went over to the white well yeah sure enough there was this Belgian guy uh, and he was wearing a suit and uh, so um, I met him and he was uh, Luke Mertens uh, um, who's now famous in the, in the annals of magic history and we uh, I, I so he took me to lunch okay. and I explained the game to him I explained what he wanted and he was like very nonchalant. Yeah, we can do that. I was explaining. Yeah, well, but we want playing card quality cards. You know, like casino cards. He says, Yeah, we make casino cards, uh, but they have to be collated randomly. And he's like, Oh yeah, we we're going to get. We had a project at one point to get into trading cards, huh. and so we bought this collation equipment, oh. and so we can do these. Yeah. You know, it's back in the. It turns out it was like back in an old warehouse. They had to dust it off and get it working again. But they had the uh, equipment to, to, to do both. Interesting. So, and, there, so there was no precedent up to that point. They had not printed anything really but casino materials and playing cards for casinos, poker cards, basically. They were primarily a poker cards and tarot cards, tarot cards uh, right. uh, company and, uh, and other game cards, but mainly that. And what made, and what made uh, you said his name was Luke? Luke Merton. Yeah, Luke's so, yeah. Luke so confident that he could he could produce magic the way that you guys wanted, or did you even have a specific directive about what you wanted? Did you even know? But you know, when you when you make trading card games, you know, you usually have a multi page document listing all the printer specifications of exactly how the trading cards should be made. Of course, we didn't know that because no trading card games had ever been made. Yeah. And we also just were not experts at buying, you know, buying a print run from a card company and so you know, nowadays you would go if i were to do it again i would uh, go look up one of my old templates and um it would have what type of card stock you want and the dimensions on the corners and it would have all this sort of technical stuff we just said no we want cards we didn't even tell them Not what the size we didn't even tell them the size of the cards oh my god it's just so imagine imagine if magic had been printed you know six inches well tall, each no, card no, but he things. knew we were going to shuffle yeah. them right i mean he knew that these cards were meant to be played with right so um he uh uh so it, it wouldn't have been that far off there's just it, it strikes me that there are just so many things that were incredibly fortuitous in terms of their decisions. Obviously, you yes. went, up with, you went yes. up with the alpha board essentially by accident because that right. was the precedent for everything that they had printed up to that point. If you were to probably I, hold an alpha card next to a casino card in a casino in Monaco, you might find that yeah. they overlap exactly, right? Yeah. I, Monaco. Yeah, I think the... Monaco, I think, yeah, Monaco, 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 Utah, 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 Utah <laughs> whatever. Monaco. Monaco and Macau, yes. right? There's in separate Monica. places. Yeah, there's just, yeah. Monaco. Yeah. Monaco. Yeah. Monaco. Monaco. I like Monaco. Is that also right. where, the, where you go to YouTube dot... Uh, you, uh, you, Utah doc yeah, well, that's Utah. they're incorporated there's servers oh they're known for Utah yes. yeah. they're yeah. known for Utah yeah. Yeah. all right hold on a sec all right guys tell me comments below who's Beavis and who's Butthead in this conversation yeah. all right all right, yeah. all right. so okay I have no hair. did we did we answer did we uh so Ryan where is Mon what country is Monaco in <laughs> Monaco is right next door to Monaco <laughs> and where's Monaco in Wait, Monica's not a place either. <laughs> I'm a cow. Anyway, the point being, okay. some, some European place where they have poker okay. cards, right? All right, back to the topic. So we got, yeah. okay, so we answered uh, Luke was a shining star at, at, okay. Talk about, talk about 
uh, the uh, the process of you know were they were they reliable the whole time? I mean, how did that process work? So um, it was uh, it was so fortuitous to have found Luke Mertens and, and Carter Monday because we weren't sophisticated enough to give them real precise um, uh, a, a purchase order. A proper purchase order of exactly yeah. what the specifications of the cards should be, um, but they filled in the blanks, you know. And um, I think the funniest piece of it for me was the packaging. Huh. Um, after we, we we sort of organized everything, uh, it was yes, the packaging. Uh, it was <laughs> it was uh, uh, when I followed up with them a few months later and said, okay, I think we have all the uh, artwork ready and, and we're going to send it to you. We're ready to, to do this job. Netflix, he please call like, me. Okay, what do you, how do you want to package this? And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, we hadn't even considered that, right? No, because like, Alpha, like Alpha I was thinking, I, I was thinking of the. Con I'm such a gamer, right? I'm thinking right. of the contents. Here are all the cards. We're going to have a rules booklet. Yeah. And it's going to be in a box, right? A tuck box, right? Because an interesting, but, just sorry to interrupt, but an interesting note about Alpha that many people may not realize is that there were no boosters in Alpha, right? Boosters came along with Beta. They didn't actually. There were no Alpha booster packs at all. It was all starters. No, there were Alpha. Boosters. There were Alpha boosters. Yes. Yeah, of course. You told me that there were just Alpha. I starters. never said that. That's what you made up in your own imagination at Birdie Man. My life is a lie. Where'd you get this guy? At hey, Birdie Man. I found him. <laughs> he was the guy in Columbus with the Russians. Of course, there was an Alpha. Of course he bought. He booster. bought the. He bought the house with booster. the Russians with the TV. Yeah. I, I'm telling I'm gonna you blame, right now. I'm going to blame Daniel for this oh piece my of God. This is all. Okay. Is, all right, all right, all right continue on. Okay, right. Send me a professional next time. <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> this video is going to be epic. <laughs> okay. So, so, so the thing is, is that we knew that we wanted booster packs in the flow wrap, right? Because yeah. that's a classic, you know, trading card, bubblegum sort of combo, right? right of course. Flow wrap right. with the cards in and it. And why right? no bubblegum? Oh, God. <laughs> I, I could, I, if I had a black lotus for every time somebody's asked me that question. Oh, wait, you I, literally ask that? Oh, wait, I it do. It seems like wait. a natural fit. Yeah, you do it. I do. <laughs> for sale, everybody, contact Daniel at VintageMagic.com you for your right. only black lotus potential. Yeah, there you go. Bubblegum. Can you see bubblegum? Yeah, bubblegum. I'll, I'll send you some bubblegum. Was, <laughs> was there actual consideration of bubblegum? Or was that? No, no, of course okay. not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's been asked of me many, many times. Okay, so um, <laughs> but really, when you're Peter Atkinson, you love Brock's mixed egg milks, mal eggs, mal malted mal eggs milks. This yeah, is okay. yeah, Brock's did not pay us for this all advertisement. Right, continue. Okay, continue. Okay, okay. okay. all right, yeah, continue. Was, okay. you jumped the shark. All right, so That's why no bubble gum? Go ahead. Okay, okay. So where were we? We were we were talking about why no bubble gum? Yeah, we were, well, we were at the bubblegum point, but we were talking about the alpha print run, specifically the decisions that you said were fortuitous. So yeah, so. Luke Mertens and Carta Monday made a lot of decisions uh, for us. And the thing, and we, we, had, we about, never we talked about packaging. packaging. We never really thought about the packaging. Ooh. And Luke reaches out to me, like when I called him about December of 1992, and said, okay, uh, all the art's coming in. I think we're about ready to go to press. Do um, you still want, it, want this job? And he's like, yes. And, um, and we're like, okay, well... What do we do? Like, how do we prepare the files for you? Like, what what do we do next? So we you never had, printed cards before. So you had right? the art finalized by September of 1992. No, not totally finalized. But we were coming in, and we were we were we felt um, that it was reliable to anticipate when the rest of the card was art was going to be done. Like, okay. like you you wouldn't want to wait till the art was all done and then call the printer, right? Okay. So it was like, okay, we have art coming in. Uh, we see uh, that this is all going to come together. We think we're going to raise the money. You're doing several things in parallel. And so Luke uh, says, well, how about if I come out uh, and see you guys, and I'll bring die lines. And what are die and, lines? Uh, die lines, okay, so if you imagine a, um, uh, a sheet of, like, a, like for playing card, like everybody knows magic is on these big sheets, right, 11 by 11, 121 yeah. cards on, on one sheet. A die line is like a card sheet with just lines at where all the uh, the borders of the cards are. And so a graphic designer can look at that and figure out how to make how, how to lay out the cards uh, so that. And then he talked also about the packaging. And we're like, oh, like uh, the packaging. Yeah, of course we have to do art for the packaging. That makes sense. 
Yeah. <laughs> Naturally, you but, may need that. But he's, and, and so the dialing for packaging seems a lot more necessary than what I just described for the cards because what you have, if you take a booster pack and you open it up, you can lay that piece of foil flat, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's how it's printed. It's printed in a flat sheet of this foil, and then it's cut, and then it's folded up and glued together, and the card is stuck into it, and, and it goes out, right? Okay. Okay, so that die line describes the dimensions of that flow wrap when it's laying flat. Also for the tuck boxes, and also then for the point of purchase displays, which yeah. is the piece that we hadn't considered. And so he, he mentioned, like, well, how's this going to look on the counter? And he explained to us the idea of a point of purchase display, which, of course, we can visualize, but we hadn't thought of. And so he said, listen, why don't I just bring you guys the die lines for all these and we can go together? And we're like... We were so blown away that he was going to fly all the way from Belgium to Seattle. Did he even go through all the trouble? Us. Yes. Did he go through all the trouble to fly <laughs> to Seattle potential. and meet with yeah. us? And so we're like, wow, we couldn't believe it. Like, okay. And, of course, at this point in time, Wizards of the Coast was in the basement of my house. Yeah. And so the irony of this guy showing up from Belgium in a suit and a tie <laughs> to the basement of my house where I had 17 people working in two rooms on like four laptops or, or PCs at the time, yeah, yeah, right? Of course. Um, was pretty funny. But Luke was always just cool. Like he was like, okay. Like never give off any sort of um, curiosity about these crazy people in Seattle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just roll with the punches and be professional. And he, he walked us through it. It was amazing. Like, Luke, Luke deserves to be recognized in the annals of Magic history as somebody who contributed greatly to the success of Magic the Gathering. Yeah, clearly, I, the guy that basically designed the aesthetic of the cards and the way that they felt and looked the packaging and all those things that people, I think, really take for granted, probably. Yeah, and I'm sure he leaned on his team. I don't want to leave yeah. out people at Card of Monday. Is but Luke still at Card of Monday? Just no, he, he yeah. retired a, few, a couple okay. years ago. No. Um, he just came back out of retirement last year to write a book about 50 years of Card of Monday. And, in fact, he came to Seattle and interviewed yeah. me and several of the Watson crew. Love so, the, yeah, yeah, so that company goes back 50 years. Wow. Before, oh, before they no, were, I mean, this kind of, no, no, way back... To, Way earlier than that. Really? Yeah. yeah this, this, uh, it was a fifty-year thing, but I just I think part of Monday will last fifty years. Yeah, yeah. Part of Monday experience. Yeah. 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 And they're certainly known in, I think, in most people's esteem as the company that printed magic and still prints magic. But well, the that's fact how that they we. Had it, All right, guys, we'll be right back for a short commercial break, and we're going to uh, we're ask off. one more question. No, lots of good questions. No, we're going to ask one more question because we're going to continue on with our day. Lots of questions. Hold on, everybody. All right, after the, the, the malted egg break, uh, we're back. All right, Brian has a few more questions, Brian. Uh, yeah, hopefully, sing, Single malt yeah. break. So, McAllen, please give us a, a little bit of a sponsorship. So, the, of this so the first question I actually had, and I wanted you to actually confirm this, I had a conversation with Mark Tadeen, one of the original artists a while ago, and this related to the process that the artists went through when they were determining which original founding iconic art pieces they wound up illustrating. Okay. And the, the story that Mark related to me was that you got people on the phone and that you had a, basically a list of every card that had already been designed and named. And you just went down the list. And if the artist heard a, a name of a card that sounded interesting to them, <laughs> that they would just say, oh, well, that sounds cool. I'll illustrate I, that. I think the story is true if you substitute me for yes, yes for, for Mere Yes. For mere yes. Okay. Yes. yes. So the answer, I, yeah. I, uh, I unfortunately did not get to, uh, I, I shouldn't say unfortunately, Jesper did an amazing job going out and finding artists who would work for my cheap ass rates. <laughs> and where were they, where and, were those artists located? Were they all Seattle artists or were they, <clears throat> there, they? There was a bunch of them in Seattle and then there was a bunch that were elsewhere in the sort of fantasy. Peter, how cheap ass was it? So everybody remind <laughs> themselves how cheap ass was it? Because I know the rate. Go ahead. 50 bucks. And $50 in stock. $50 cash and $50 in the stock in of this, cheap ass, uh, was, <laughs> not cheap ass games. That's, uh, that, that's that nobody had ever heard of it. That, that's yeah, a different company. company. Uh, no, it was, yeah, paper money stock in Wizards of the Coast, which uh, I assured every artist would probably never be worth anything. <laughs> and you, 
<laughs> we still knew it. Yeah, so apparently, and it's amazing to think of which artists, the artists associated with specific specific art pieces and just the uh, intuition and instincts that they had about, like Mark Tadine, for example, if you look at what Mark Tadine wound up illustrating in Alpha, Soaring, well, yeah. Chaos Orb, Time Twister, like how did he know? <laughs> oh, I, what's the question? I'm, I don't know. I was just <laughs> confirming the story. <laughs> But you know what's funny about that, Brian, is that I never think I've never thought of it about the correlation of the artist to which cards ended up being the best cards, the best cards from exactly. a competitor. Like uh, to me, my emotional attachment to a lot of the art from Alpha, especially, um, uh, has to do with just what the card looks like. You know, like 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 I loved Lanamore Elves. Yeah. I mean, I I love that like. Like when this when that art from Anson Maddox came in with the Lanamar Elves, I remember Richard Garfield yeah. looking at that art and says, "Okay, well that's not exactly what I expected." Yeah, it's like a cyber <laughs> elf or something, right? Yeah, it's got yeah. This weird little, you know, this one too, but, right? Little but cybernetic was, eye well, or something. And Time Walk uh, by Amy Weber is my all-time favorite piece of magic art. Why? My, well, why is that? And my all-time favorite card from mechanically and artistically. Why is that? I don't for, know. Mechanically and art. Weird looking. It's like surrealistic guys walking through some portal down and a path. So, and yet I it's mean, so perfect, that's right? that's a journey, right? It's a yeah. it's a journey of these people. They're upright and walking, but they're skeletons. And I don't know. That's it's like a Salvador Dali sort of thing. Yeah, right? I was. I, to me, that card was always very evocative. It's an amazing, evocative looks... card. And I always loved any game mechanic that gives you an extra turn. Ah, oh, very powerful. Um, so, and my other question was, is that when the game actually was finally printed, when they delivered you, because pre-Gen Con, you had actually gone on this famous road trip where you went, apparently you got in your car and you loaded stuff in your trunk and you drove down the West Coast. That's right. Trying to find game stores that would actually be interested in that, because obviously getting anybody to try any game at all is a real right. challenge. Right. Particularly if you're coming from an unknown publisher, a relatively unknown publisher at the time. And... Uh, but I'm curious from your perspective about when you first got those first alpha cards in your hands from Cardamundi when they were done and went to press and so on, what did that feel like to actually have the cards in your hand? Did you... Oh my God, you I, I remember just thinking. Yeah. So the first time I held... I had a, a schedule with Cardamundi as to when they were going to deliver the cards, ship the cards. And the whole idea was that, that we would receive the cards at time to turn around and ship them out in time for Gen Con 1993. When, what month was that? Uh, so July okay. for an August show. So in June, I believe somebody's going to check the dates, see if I got this right. But <laughs> June ish, uh, <laughs> about a month before I was. Yeah. Sorry, guys, we had a little bit of editing issue. We're back at it. So June, yeah, yeah. yeah. So around June of 1993, um, uh, the Origins show was happening, yeah. and um, so. I was literally packing my bags to go to Origins, and I got a phone call from Luke, Luke Mertens, yep. at Carta Monday. And Luke was in his very nonchalant sort of professional way. Hello, Peter. We have some magic cards. Would you like to see them? Wow. I'm, I'm like, you have magic cards already? Like, I didn't think they'd be done for another Peter, month. Peter, do that again. But You're like a space guy. Like, a, like hello, Peter. Well, all right. Okay. Yeah, do, do, I'm not really trying to do it. By the way, we're zooming at access. you. We're zooming at you. It's just like, Hello, um, uh, no, he just, Luke would always talk so nonchalant. Like, for us, this is like the most exciting time in our life. Oh, my God, there are magic cards. And Luke's like, um, you know, this morning I went into the factory and, <laughs> hey, there were some magic cards. And I thought maybe you would like to see some. Should I send them to you? And I'm like, <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> yes. Send me the magic cards. We'd really like to see them. And it was a surprise because I wasn't expecting them for a month. But, of course, you think about intellectually, of course, there's a time lag between when the first cards come off the printing press and when the last ones are going to come off. And then there's more steps in the process. Yeah. They have to be shoved into, into booster packs or tuck boxes and then into the display and blah, 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 blah. And I think, yeah, anyway, yes. I'm about to go to the airport to go to Origins, and he's and though and he's like, well, I'll just ship them DHL to your hotel in Origins. 
I didn't even know such a thing. The overnight shipping that's from Belgium, that's a thing? Like, I, like, wow. It is 93, like, but they do have and, jets. And you can ship to a hotel? Okay, there's a lot of things we take for granted. We're on a budget, Brian. There's no private jets no, for no, Magic Cards. No, no, it's not private. This, this, this is like 1993. Three. The scanners, yeah. the three, scanners right? were like five thousand dollars for like a piece of paper. I mean, yeah. we're like, like, yeah. uh, you know, overnight shipping and stuff like that. And I'm like, okay, yeah, I'm at this hotel. Let me try and figure out the address. Oh no, I'll look it up. Okay, great. So, I go to Origins on uh, the flights on Wednesday, and sure enough, by Friday. Uh, the cards arrive at the hotel. And how much arrive? This is okay. Alpha. Alpha boosters or Starks? <laughs> no, they weren't packaged. They were These were packaged. cards fresh off the... Just oh, the cards. Oh my so god, the what, smell. What he sent us... <laughs> yes, they were just cards in like these boxes. You know, just a long like, box. Yeah, yeah, just a long box. And there was... Uh, there was, I believe, just one press sheet of each. Maybe there might have been more than that, but... The, the funny thing is that they were evenly distributed between common and common and rare. Just equal there was, amounts of everything. Yeah, right? just like, yeah, the equal amounts of everything. So it was actually kind of hard to build decks that would work right. Yeah. If you were playing a singleton format way back in 93, <laughs> they're very popular right. now. Right. Uh, yeah. Everybody go to Facebook, uh, Seven Point Singleton exactly. below. Brian's Old obviously. Singleton. You, know, you want to say about that? <laughs> okay. I've talked about so, it. This is yeah. Peter's story. Yeah. So, so, uh, so the first time that yeah. I saw. Actual Magic Cards was at the Origins Convention in 1993. Crazy. Uh, and so, if uh, some people think, say, oh, Magic was launched at Origins. No, it was the first time it was shown to public. Mm -hmm. It was launched at Gen Con, let's be clear about that. <laughs> but yes, we did have Magic Cards at Origins. Gen Con dot com, everybody. So John, had, Gen Con dot com. So you're making it sound like you only had literally one set of Alpha. With you, or was it multiple sets at least? I don't know. Probably. It was it was some it was it was evenly distributed between uh, common and common and rare. But of course, they were all alpha cards. So describe yeah. to me that feeling of opening that box for the first time. Okay, so looking the, at these cards. Yeah, so you never seen them. Okay, so looking at history, this is like opening the Ark of the Peter. Oh, that's oh, a pro Peter. Peter, Peter, that's an unlimited card, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, uh, the other ones over there are proxies. Here we go. Yeah, this yeah. is an alpha lotus. Right right. Here's an alpha lotus. Okay, of course, we didn't realize the Alpha Lotus was that important at the time. But if I'm on a video, of course, I'm going to pick up the Lotus. So, you know, it's a Lotus. Yeah. Um, the thing that I was disappointed at going into it was that you you could see how some of the titles... Yeah, the, the a font little, is so great. A little hard to read. Very hard to read, yeah. It's interesting. And it I was story. having nightmares that... People that we would get these cards from Card of Monday, you wouldn't be able to read them. Yeah, it's a very yeah. good But of course, Card of Monday is not going to fucking ship us cards that you can't read. I mean, like. <laughs> there goes the monetization like, of this video, like, Peter. I rely on this for my life bleep, and family. Bleep it. You can but I don't edit anything because you said I was very untraditional. What did you say? Okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's okay. And so <laughs> I was so excited to get the cards. It was very emotional, but I was filled with apprehension about whether I'd be able to read the cards. And when I got the cards and noticed that. With some strain, I could read them. It was a big load off my mind. Like, okay, these cards are readable. Real and substantial, though. This is right. like a thing right. in your hand. Right. Um, did you have any other feelings about them? I don't know if you had ever collected things like baseball well, cards just, or anything in the past. No, I, I've never been much of a collector. I, there was just this release that you get the first time you see a product that you've worked on for yeah. two or three years. Uh, finally come into fruition but it was tempered by a lot of stress about money yeah like of like getting i didn't have enough money to pay the printing bill <laughs> so um everybody release at the utub himself it yeah, was very release. epic uh, <laughs> what are you talking about this is a historic story and you're talking about UTUB. hey uh, what is it? No, by the way to... brian 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 honestly when you meet when you talk to peter does it feel like an infinite amount of just, like, because you are this, you know, just player who just love this game. It's but it, more than just that. I mean, the game is, has provided a cornerstone for my entire adult life. I, I learned magic when I was 19 years old. I mean, it's really, it's been a focal point, a yeah. nexus of my entire existence well, and, oh. for 27 years. And this guy is, you know, he's the Messiah. Peter, anyway. Peter, Messi well, Messiah, well, uh, Messiah, by the way. Your name is Messiah now? Messiah. Um <laughs> For players, I, I actually have a good question on this. Players, have you ever thought that magic could be where it is today? 
where they can make a living, or even back in the day, he made a living to survive to play magic as actually a. Well, certainly. Did you think that? Did you think that? Did you think certainly that? not in 1993, but okay. 1996 we were thinking that. I mean, yeah, by okay. the time we started the the, the world, pro, the yeah. pro tour. That was the whole idea. But the initial, incep- the initial right. inception, it was not. Thing. But yeah. the initial inception, it was not. Well, keep in, no. keep in mind that one, one thing that I've heard quoted before, and this is something I know Richard has talked about, is that the precedent up to that point as far as a gaming hobby was that people would have a whole bunch of different gaming hobbies, and they might spend $25, $30 a year on that hobby. And that that idea informed the uh, the issue with the crazy power disparity that was that existed in Alpha. The idea being that cards like Black Lotus, Ancestor Recall, and Moxes, and so on were very powerful and disruptive from a balance standpoint. But that wasn't really a consideration because the game was meant to be something that people would buy maybe a starter yeah, deck and a few boosters. Yeah, they would it, play and trade with friends, and then they'd move on to the next thing. Well, and in, really in one community, expansion. there would only be a couple of them. Yeah, exactly. And that, that you would right. never see a crazy consolidation of yeah. abusive yeah. levels of power yeah. manifested in one yeah. deck like this, for example. Yeah. You would have to be the CEO of Wizards of the Coast to get this many Alpha Lotuses and Sapphires, and yeah. that would be the Unless the game problem. just went really crazy. Yeah. Unless then, it went really, really crazy. In, in that case, well... So it would have been very casual up to that point, and people's engagement in gaming right. in general had not been obsessive and collected right. the way that you guys... I don't think that you could have predicted that, at least. And And that was, of course, also... But you don't predict something like that and maintaining maintain any sense of modesty about yourself. I mean, you don't. Right, you would never running, imagine the behavior. When you're running right? a business, there's always a part in the back of your mind that, that hopes the business will be really successful. Right. And that hopes that this game will be a big hit. But you don't really allow yourself to think that. Yeah, and on top of that also, I and mean, this relates to what you were saying about how the fact that you... You didn't even have enough money to print as many of the cards as you want. I know that a lot of people, myself included, spent years thinking, oh, there was this this genius behind the way that they throttled all the early print runs. How could they have foreseen that by only printing a, a handful of alphas and a handful of betas and arabians, that this giant mystique would grow up around the game where there was this crazy sense of scarcity and so on, and that would help fuel people's enthusiasm about the game. No, and then well, it turns out that it, it's entirely accidental. All right, they guys. It, they did well, it we, got one more, they we got one more question coming up, guys. Thank you so much. I, I get the last question. Hold on. All right. I get the last question. Peter, yes. good question. Entrepreneurial? Anything for, you for, want to for, know. For, no. For, for anybody out there, I want everybody, because I talk about magic finance. I talk about entrepreneurship. You are the entrepreneur you know we we we, we want to know what would, what are some tips some some thoughts books maybe just things you would do starting out that you've learned that you would give advice to to any young uh, entrepreneur anything advice anything advice to entrepreneurs yeah okay um okay so what i would say as an entrepreneur to other entrepreneurs is don't ever run your company based on cliches. Somebody has like this little piece of wisdom that they say, oh, the customer is always right. Or, oh, uh, let's see, speed, quality, price, only take two. These cliches that people throw at you about how business works, no. If you start believing in cliches and you stop thinking about your business, at every point in your business, think about the problem and solve it. Don't do it based on some some piece of wisdom that somebody gives. The cliches do have insights. Sayings about how business should be and about the role of customers and your relationship to your shareholders, your relationship to your employees, your relationship to your investors. All these things have some amount of value, but none of them are some sort of absolute truth think about each problem critically and solve it thank you peter well and on that guys next video guys brian thank you so much you're welcome all right we're gonna that 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 was just good all right that's great and we're gonna guys again if you're interested in purchasing peter's original alpha deck there are some proxies we're gonna get that in the next video but uh six alpha lotuses seven alpha like Mock sapphires, sapphires and, and this is all upside down in some apple juice with some uh, soda water. All right, from have a good day. Highlands of Scotland. Yes, congratulations <laughs> and Braveheart. All right, see you later. Thank you everyone for supporting our channel. It means a lot to me that you're enjoying the content we're putting out there. 
I have a Patreon page that supporters have access to special perks and rewards. Become a supporter at patreon.com slash vintage magic. As a patron, you receive exciting pricing on sealed product, flash sales, annual gifts, and personalized consulting services from me. Again, thank you for subscribing to our videos and supporting the channel. I love meeting players, collectors, and investors all over the world. If you see me at a Grand Prix, please come by and say hi. I would love to meet you. Thank you everyone for your support and friendship. Thank you everyone for watching the videos. I wanted to do a special thank you to Sam Tang from Kitchen Table Magic. Uh, he's been a great friend and a great artist uh, producing the videos. Been very patient with me in his directing. <laughs> and uh, um, I also want to thank Brian Weissman. Uh, Brian and I have become uh, friends out of this, and um, I've learned a lot from him. Um, and he's spent countless hours uh, sharing his knowledge and wisdom. Without you guys and the support of my Patreon, it, you know, this would never be possible. Uh, if you guys have additional comments or suggestions, I'd love to hear from you guys. Just go to vintagemagic.com and go to the Contact Us page. I would love to hear from you. So thank you so much for watching. We'll talk to you soon. Hey everyone, it's me, Daniel, with VintageMagic.com. I want to share with you more about how we handle consignments. So to begin the consignment process, we actually need to start with the consultation service. In this consultation, I will determine what you're looking to do. And generally, consigners usually tell me, hey, Dan, I'm looking to sell my items and maximize the value of their collection. After we determine through the consultation, I usually like to do an appraisal process. And in the appraisal process, in terms of a consignment, is more fitted towards authenticity and valuation for current market values. From there, after a contract is crafted and signed, we will then receive the items from you. The reason why our consignment process is very thorough is we also identify cards that could be graded so then they can maximize higher dollar values. So the payment process is very simple. Once we have sold your items, you'll get an updated ledger and we will process payment um, for whatever form of payment you need. As a consigner, you're gonna experience our white glove service. What that means is I'm gonna personally handle your collectibles from beginning to end. And rest assured, the client that purchases your collectibles will also receive the same white glove service. It's a signature service that I really pride myself on in working closely with my clients. Vintage Magic. Game. Collect. Invest. For more information about our consulting and professional services, visit VintageMagic.com.